Another Founder Wisdom pod today with Jennifer Iserlaw. She is founder at Body Soul Academy and co-founder at Big Boost uh, Media, right? That What's that one, Marketing. Jen? Mm-hmm. Marketing. Big yeah. Boost Marketing. Uh, we're going to talk about biohacking. We're going to talk about coaching. We're going to talk about spirituality, yoga, and everything in between. So, Jen, welcome to the pod. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your companies? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in the health world for over 20 years. I started my career as a professionally trained chef. I worked in some of the toughest kitchens in New York City, and then I got into health coaching. And I went to IIN. I also got a yoga certification, and I started private chefing. So out of those experiences, I decided for my health, I didn't want to stay in restaurant kitchens because It was a very stressful climate, obviously. So I started to uh, work as a health writer and a food expert. And I worked for a lot of great magazines at the time, Self Magazine, Prevention, Yoga Journal. And I also wrote a bunch of cookbooks for celebrities and continued on to my ghost writing with doctors and integrative health specialists. So I was really, you know, learning a lot about integrative medicine on my health journey. And then my husband at the time was doing a lot of web development. Uh, His background is actually, he's a PhD in chemistry and he left chemistry to work in marketing and web development. And then we sort of came together and joined forces. And now we work together in his company called Big Boost Marketing, where we help integrative and functional medicine, cash-based practices, get the word out about what they do. And it's really interesting, the kind of work we do. We're really doing this uh, mix of marketing. We use Go High Level as our tech. So it's an app that just encompasses almost everything they need. But we're also, um, you know, doing done-for-you content, done-for-you email systems programming. So, you know, that's where my expertise comes back as a health writer is just really helping practitioners um, with this done-for-you content in all different areas. And, you know, back in the day when I was in my 30s and around your age, I had plenty of energy. I was killing it. I was working 14 hours a week and making gobs of money. And then in my 40s, I started to have a health crash. And that's where I really went down deep on the rabbit hole of functional medicine. And I started to really understand where I had those gaps in my health. You know, and as a a trained health coach, I always thought, oh, I can fix anything. You know, I can biohack, I can sleep more, I can work out more, I can change my diet. Um, But at the time, I didn't realize that I had hypothyroidism and a gluten intolerance. So, you know, with these practitioners, I've learned so much. They've really changed uh, my life and the state of my health. And, you know, that's really why my husband and I love working with them because we really practice what they preach. And we're still still currently seeing an amazing person who's on the cutting edge of hormones and functional medicine. And, you know, as entrepreneurs, it's really helped us to to keep up with being entrepreneurs, because as you know, it's not an easy road. It's tough. Yeah. So that's sort of the the short of it, very condensed version of, of how I, I got to where I am now. I want to start with the kitchens because I started my career as a waiter and every time I would enter the kitchen, it would be Hell's Kitchen, you know, like people <laughs> yeah, right. screaming left and right and lots of tension, you know, while us waiters, we were very much chilled and just, you know, handling your stuff. Um, it's kind of EQ vs IQ because in the kitchen, there's a lot of uh, cooking IQ, you know, they're good at cooking stuff, but they're very poor at communicating with their team i mean usually the chef has the it's stuff together and well if if he's good he's going to manage the team as the problem was that the owners of the restaurants were were like quite stressed and they would always hang around and make things worse you know like the classic example of having a bad boss and so forth so i experienced it too um and i would manage them you know it's that's how in, in life stressful people usually you manage them right they can say whatever they want, but like at, at the end, you know, you, you have their shit under your control because they, they can't have theirs uh, under their control. Uh, but I ended up quitting um, one night, you know, and I was quite sad because I, I had a lot of fun uh, there. Uh, bottom line, I started my career uh, in restaurants. It taught me like stress management and so forth, if anything, but I felt I had to get out too because... Yeah, the tips were good and all of that, but it was very much of a toxic environment. How was your experience and how did it shape you to the gen that you are today? 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, I get a lot of comments from people that I look like the girl next door or, you know, did you grow up with having everything at your fingertips? It's like, no, I grew up in a really rough neighborhood in Pittsburgh and I worked in my dad's deli. So, you know, I really come from that perspective of working hard and it really was my passion to become a chef. It was one of my dreams, but I was discouraged because I was a woman and I was older when I started, I was 30 when I went to culinary school. So, you know, being in restaurant kitchens was hard and I feel like it really prepared me for entrepreneurship because you cannot be weak and work in a restaurant kitchen. You have to be able to be calm under stress you have to be calm when you have to put out a fire, just like you do in your company. And you have to be able to manage many different tasks while under pressure. So kind of the paradigm of working in a kitchen can sort of be like entrepreneurship, but also you can learn skills to become more efficient so that you're not having so many fires. Same thing in the kitchen, same thing in entrepreneurship. You can also build certain teamwork frames or a certain atmosphere. So if you have a better you know, chef who's open to building community and you have kind of a more friendly atmosphere where you support each other instead of everybody out for themselves. Same thing with entrepreneurship, whereas your team, you were really supportive. Same thing with your partner. If you're working with your partner in a business, is there great communication? Do you both, you know, are you both able to handle high pressure situations? If one isn't, the other one has to take the lead. So, you know, I think it it was great. It just wasn't a place where I could expand financially. Typically, when you work in a kitchen, especially if you're a woman, unfortunately, still to this day, it can be very hard to get promoted. And sometimes it can take you 10 years to get to that position of chef de cuisine. Um, I did get, I did learn a ton of skills. I wasn't working in the prep kitchen. I actually was working on the line as a full-blown cook. And that took me about three years to get there. Um, and I segued from there into private chefing because I could make triple the money as a private chef. And it's unfortunate because if I were younger, I might have stayed in the kitchen. But to be realistic, it's very hard to pay a mortgage if you're working as a cook in a restaurant kitchen. It just doesn't pay well. So, you know, the growth is there for you to understand ingredients and food and creativity, which I still use today in the medicinal sense when I'm writing for doctors. So I bring all my amazing chef skills to the food programs I write for doctors who do gut health, hormone balance, gluten-free programs. So obviously my recipes are awesome. They're not your run-of-the-mill health recipes that don't taste good, but I just knew in that industry that I couldn't get to my financial goals. And, you know, let's face it, it's just the wear and tear on the body was pretty rough as well. Now the health crisis in your 40s how did you began feeling that way and is it is it the classic thing in which your body is young and it can fix itself up until some degree in which you age and now it's not as good at recycling uh, the bad stuff like is is this what happened yeah that actually happens to everyone it's not just somebody who works a million hours and you know, really gets into burnout. So essentially what happens to our bodies as we age, especially as we enter our late thirties, forties, and fifties is of course you get wear and tear on the joints and the organs, but your hormone profile changes quite a bit. So hormones are not just the sex hormones, which is test, test, um, testosterone and estrogen, but all the hormones, your insulin, your cortisol, your melatonin, we have this cascade. So in yoga, when you think about those chakra areas, that's the endocrine system. That's where all the hormones are. So when your hormones are out of whack, everything is out of whack. Your sleep, your weight management, your mood, your ability to process calories, your sex drive, mental function, you know, your muscle tone. So I think there isn't really in conventional medicine, there's not enough stress placed on hormone health. So people start to usually feel this even in their thirties. And I know for men, every 10 years, there's a 10 degree degrade in testosterone levels. But when you get into your forties, this can manifest in terms of thyroid issues like it did for me. So you can go through these certain amount of stressors that are poorly handled, or you can have a food intolerance or a gut issue that can actually damage your thyroid and your ability to create certain hormones. So this is where I basically in my forties had full-blown hypothyroidism. 
because I was in sort of the natural healing space, I didn't want to take medication. I didn't trust my doctor. So I went the functional medicine route and I discovered that I needed hormone replacement, but not in the traditional way they do it in conventional medicine, which is basically mega dose you with one type of thyroid hormone, whether you need that type or not. They don't really test. They just test for one type, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. They never test your T3, T4. So I actually needed T3, T4 and not TSH. So, you know, that's where I started working with an amazing hormone doctor. So she did hormone replacement for that. And then there's also bioidentical hormone replacement for other things. So things like estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. And when you go through these shifts as you age, especially women, you get into perimenopause, that's up to eight years before you go through menopause, you can be majorly deficient in progesterone. You can't sleep, you're gaining weight, you're having painful periods, you're snapping at your spouse, you're mad because you can't stand the way your spouse chews. <laughs> That's like a big one for women. So, you know, if you're working with your spouse like I do and you're barking them at barking at them all the time. It's like, how can you be successful as an entrepreneur? How can you be successful in your job? What about it? What if you're snapping at your kids all the time? So, you know, what's great about these doctors is they really go through and test all your hormones. Now, hormone replacement isn't necessarily appropriate for someone in their thirties. It may be if you're a woman or a man dealing with a specific hormone imbalance, like you have PCOS, that may be an option for you, but typically your hormones are pumping pretty strong in your thirties. It's once you get into your forties and fifties. And I think what people in the health space think is that they can DIY this, that they can fix it with food. They, they can fix it with adaptogens and biohacking and cold plunges. I'm sorry, but when your hormones start to take a nosedive, you actually need to replace them. You have to do hormone restoration up to the healthy, normal levels. You don't want to make a dose. So there's a lot of stuff out there about pellets. I mean, obviously I am not a hormone doctor and I can steer you in the right direction if you, you know, are curious of who to follow. But a lot of times you go to a traditional doctor and they make a dose you with pellets that they're putting under your skin. And really that's not the right way to go either because you can have symptoms for that. You want to get your hormone levels up to a healthy, normal level. And that's where I found that, you know, hormone replacement and going the functional medicine route has been so helpful for me with my energy and just being able to hold it all together as I age. When you stop these treatments or if you stop these stream treatments, would it have a negative effect on your health? Like if you don't have these hormones one day or like, do you ever stop these therapies? How does it work? Yeah. So, you know, you need a certain level of thyroid hormone for all these functions in your body. I'm going to use thyroid because I know there's a lot of misunderstanding around the sex hormones and also in connection with cancer, which we can talk about in a second, but just think about thyroid hormones. So if you're not getting enough thyroid hormone, your thyroid gland is damaged or it's not producing enough. You're, it's like you're walking through water, right? Everything is slow. So once I went on vacation, I ran out of the thyroid pills. Guess what? Guess what? I was right back to my old, exhausted, tired self. A lot of the symptoms start coming back of not being able to wake up in the morning. My hair was breaking, low mood, couldn't focus, major brain fog. So basically all those symptoms can come back, but the beauty of going the hormone replacement route, and remember everybody is different. Some people in their forties may not need anything. If it's a woman probably needs like progesterone is probably low or something going on, but that's why you have to really test. You're not going to just go and get hormone replacement for the heck of it. You need to know what you're deficient in. So what you need to bring up to normal levels. And yes, when you come off of it, you feel it. But in terms of biohacking, when you get into your fifties, like in the case of me, you want to consider doing this type of hormone restoration because it affects you long-term with chronic illness. So there's uh, just a ton of studies out there. I highly recommend uh, following Sarah Gottfried is one of them. She's a doctor from Harvard. She's amazing. She wrote the book called The Hormone Cure. So she talks about the studies and why women are more prone to dementia than men. And that's because our hormones degrade so rapidly after the age of 50, where men's hormone degradation is more level. 
So it's really interesting to understand that a lot of the chronic illnesses like heart disease, women are more susceptible because estrogen is cardioprotective. Estrogen protects your bones. Progesterone, progesterone uh, protects your brain. You know, so we want to look at this from a perspective of how can we live longer with a better quality of life and feel better? And I don't want people to think of hormone restoration or hormone replacement as medication or a pill. It's not that it's, they're the identical hormones. If you're doing bioidentical that your body make, and you're restoring these things to optimal level. Another person in the space who is my personal doctor, I am so blessed to have her is the hormone guru on TikTok. She's triple board certified. She's OBGYN, MD, integrative functional medicine. She also has a background in anti-aging medicine. So she's someone who prescribes in a very conservative way. And what she'll do is with me is she'll put me on certain hormones I'm deficient in, in lower doses, and then retest in three months to make sure we're in the zone and then tweak them. So the dangers of hormone replacements, including cancer and all these other issues and side effects comes with mega dosing people which unfortunately a lot of traditional MDs because they can prescribe will give you pellets. So the way pellets work is they put this little pellet under the skin in your hip and it is supposed to last for three months. So it's not a daily dose of hormones like you get in a pill, a patch or a cream. Doesn't mean hormones are bad or pellets are bad for everyone. Some people actually need them because the pellets and the pills aren't absorbed as well, but that's a very rare case. So with the pellets, you get this big spike of hormone in the beginning, and then it tapers off. So that's a that's kind of a no-no for women with breast cancer and estrogen. So you can also think of how that kind of correlates to taking a mega dose of birth control, but that's a whole nother topic. I don't know if I want to get into that on this podcast. Yeah, so the no, idea is the dose matters, bioidentical, and having a practitioner who really knows how to test you to get the right amount. Right. When it comes to food, what are your top um, five biohacks or superfood that you get to enjoy nowadays? Yeah, gosh, with food, um, my focus has changed dramatically now that I'm on the cusp of menopause. So I think in my 30s, it was much more about delicious, healthy uh, comfort food makeovers. I still do comfort food makeovers and on my TikTok, body, soul, alchemy, um, I now have more of a focus to gluten-free, high protein, delicious meals. So probably more appropriate for people that are in the fitness space, also perimetopause, menopausal women, and people who also are just interested in longevity because I have, um, you know, obesity, insulin resistance, and all these metabolic things in my family. So, you know, my hacks right now are how can you take high protein meals and make them really delicious? So I have hundreds of recipes on my TikTok. Um, you can check it out there. But the idea is just making these breakfasts. You know, I like to have breakfast tacos, but I do them with delicious wraps. Of course, I love cottage cheese. Cottage cheese is now making a big comeback, but, you know, you got to do it organic. I still do tons of vegetables, um, kale, spinach, red bell pepper, Vegetables are not all created equal. You want to do the superfood vegetables. Superfoods are not a fad. They have a hundred to a thousand times more nutrients than a vegetable that's not in the superfood class. I also work with adaptogenic foods, which are a special class of foods, herbs, and roots that can actually modulate your stress. So that idea of the stress response. So when your cortisol is sort of triggering, you can incorporate these adaptogens. So I make them taste good by putting them in smoothies and drinks. So I'm sure you've heard of the mushroom coffee and putting things like ashwagandha in a berry smoothie, but you also have to have an eye on, is your smoothie a sugar bomb or is it something that you know supports you in terms of your insulin balance and your muscle tone? So all my recipes are just naturally constructed to do that, but I always find ways to make them taste good because for me, a healthy habit doesn't stick if it doesn't taste good. So that's really what the overarching thing that I do in my coaching and with my videos and what the sort of the gift that I give to practitioners when I work with them too. How do we make these lifestyle changes appealing? I mean, I think with the longevity stuff and, and the BHRT, it's like, yeah, people in their 50s who have aches and pains and trouble losing weight and their hair is falling out the cell is already there, but with the lifestyle stuff, it's much harder. So the cell is make it taste good. Then you don't feel like going out and eating junk food because you have something that tastes similar. So other hacks I use are, um, 
uh, extracts. So flavor extracts are a great way not to add sugar and add flavor. Flavored seltzer waters, fresh herbs, texture is really important if you can get to the texture of something you really like. So a lot of hardcore cooking techniques that I learned working in restaurant kitchens to make chicken softer and more flavorful, marinades for meats, grilling techniques. So I teach all the you know, the knife skills and the techniques on my TikTok as well. So I have a great following there. I don't get into the bioidentical hormone stuff on there because it's just, it's too much. So I would definitely go to my doctor's TikTok, which is hormone guru, if you want to learn more about that. Right. Most of the time with superfoods, it's digestion. You know, there's so many things in there that the gut has problems to digest. So it's like, what do you do to uh, accelerate or optimize digestion, which is super important? Yeah. So digestion is a huge thing. I was an IBS sufferer for over 20 years. So that was my first foray into learning, learning about functional medicine. And I was still DIYing a lot of stuff though. It wasn't until my forties that I started seeing a practitioner. So in my travels and working with practitioners and healing my own gut issues, um, you know, I found that really one of the most important thing beyond even switching your food, you do want to change up your food, but if you've changed your diet and you don't feel any better, you need to figure out if you have a food intolerance and those food sensitivity tests online, do not cut it. You need to get Cyrex or a GI map and have an actual practitioner. And I know you have to pay out of pocket. Sometimes it can cost you a thousand or $2,000 to work with a practitioner, but if you're sick every day, it'll be the greatest money you've ever spent. And also once you get your gut sorted out, your weight will get sorted out. Your hormones will be in better balance. A lot of our hormones are made in the gut. A lot of our hormones are detox through the gut and through the liver as well. So if you have too much estrogen, it, chances are you have gut issues. So that's one piece. That's how I found out I had a gluten intolerance. The other piece is please stop eating processed junk food, cook whole foods. Yes. Organic is a thing. Pesticides are a major disruptor for gut health. I know organic is expensive. Go to Trader Joe's, try to find a way to do organic. Even if you can, you know, cut eating out by half, you're going to do a huge, you know, uh, something good for your gut. And the other piece to it too, is just focus on protein and vegetables. And, you know, this is going to be hard for the folks that are in the vegan and the vegetarian. I was vegetarian for almost eight years. I feel you, but the truth of the matter is a lot of people do really well on lean protein and it's very hard to get low carb protein when you're a vegetarian, unless you do some eggs or fish. And, you know, I might get some, some hate mail for that, but it's just the truth of the matter. Grass-fed meats, organic meats, pasture-raised, protein and vegetables should be the star of your plate. When we're talking about grains, you can get the same nutrition from a handful of nuts. You do not need to eat two cups or three cups of grains, just a lot of excess calories. So part of what I did before I started the company with my husband, I worked for Atkins and I wrote cookbooks for Atkins and, and um, keto companies. So I ran a ton of nutritional data, very eye-opening. So I think when people think they're eating two cups of quinoa, they're eating healthy, but that's equivalent to, you know, one and a half bagels. It's the same for your blood sugar. I Grains are not necessarily that great for you. It's just, you know, that might be a little mind blowing. It doesn't mean you can't have grains, but it's about the amount for a woman in her fifties. It's about a half a cup of cooked grains on your plate. You know, it should be about 30 grams of protein. The rest should be vegetables. And I know it sounds sad. I love carbs too, but you know, if you want to maintain weight, you want to keep your blood sugar in check. Those are sort of my tips. And then again, there's always ways to make all those things delicious. And there's a million swaps for things like wraps and breads and pastas. You know, we've got the zucchini pasta. We have the egg wraps. There's so many things you could do, you know, to as, as swaps for things that you used to love. I, bagels are a little tricky. I haven't found a swap for that yet, but you know, there's a lot you can do out there, but if you really want to optimize your gut health and your healing, you have to focus on those nutrients because we need to fit, feed the gut bugs as well. So the fibers and vegetables are what feeds the gut bugs and those proteins also help to heal the gut lining. So a lot of times when people are doing a high carb vegan or junk food diet, they're eating all the stuff that feeds a bad bacteria. So most of uh, most of our gut is actually policed by bacteria and we need to feed them too with good quality fibers. Sourdough bagel, something like that. Uh, <laughs> I have my bagel yeah, place Yeah, if you're making Canada. it, absolutely. Absolutely <laughs> sourdough. It breaks down the gluten as well. Yeah. Uh, last question. How 
does one work successfully with their spouse? Uh, I guess you have experience into that. So I'm all ears uh, there. Yeah, I think I only know a handful of couples in our space that are still married that work together. It can be an extreme challenge. And uh, I think my husband and I have have really grown together and gone through many iterations of our different businesses to finally merge one business together. So the first thing is having a shared vision. A lot of times, like one person wants to do one thing, the other person wants to do another, and the person with the strongest will wins out. And then that builds resentment. So you guys have to have the same mission. So, you know, my husband and I have exactly the same mission, even though he's a tech marketing guy and I'm a chef content writer, you think, how can that even be possible? But our mission is to really help people get the help they need from integrative and functional medicine practitioners, right? So how do we help people connect with these practitioners who can change the landscape of your health and your life? That is the mission. Second piece is to make sure that you each are very, very sort of strict about the duties you do in the company. Don't do shared duties. You each have sort of your own jobs. I know when we first started out, we both wanted to do the design element and my husband's creative, but I feel like I'm more creative. So a lot of the design elements, the colors, the photos, all that stuff started to fall in my camp. So it's the idea of being very clear what the roles are that's really important. And then the third piece is about communication. So the communication is having time just to sit down and really kind of look at what works, what doesn't work, where you need to bring a specialist in, how are you running the team? I mean, currently we have a team of 15 people. So I do help my husband with management, but we're constantly having to go back and kind of redefine new roles or roles that have changed. And also as we upgrade our team, upgrade our finances and upgrade our products, that can change. So that's kind of the major framework of how we work together. And then the third piece is really about having that sacred time together as a couple that doesn't involve work at all. So tempting to go out to dinner and just turn it into a business meeting when it's supposed to be date night. So this is why the sacred time is just looking, if we look on our phone, it's like dog videos or something fun. It's a shared experience that's completely independent of the work. We actually don't relegate this just to date night. We do do one date night a week, but we actually have three nights a week we do this and we do it in the hot tub. We have a hot tub. That sounds dirty, but we have, <laughs> we have this time in the hot tub and we go and we do our hot tub. We don't talk, we actually don't talk in the hot tub. We just completely have this shared experience as a couple chilling out, de-stressing. And it's kind of interesting that that hot tub time for us is where we both regulate our nervous systems together versus in the company where sometimes we make each other more stressed. So it's kind of interesting how that sacred time can also inform on how we treat each other in the company. So I noticed once we start doing that sacred time, I tend to say things, tend to watch what I say that I'm not stressing my spouse out in company you know, when we're having company meetings and being more stabilizing and productive. So, you know, when you have a company together, the crap is going to hit the fan, no matter what, you're going to have times where you're in the weeds and you have to be able to manage that time. I find the sacred time and the, the personal connection you have as a company informs that or more, or creates, improves upon that. So if you have the communication the patience, the forgiveness, and the relationship. The relationship should always come first. You can do anything with a company. You can weather any storm. You can make it happen. We've had companies, we had a company, a food company that went under. We were $500,000 in debt. In three years, the two of us paid it all off with freelance and we started a new company. And now we live in the dream house that we live in, which is at the Jersey shore. It's an amazing five uh, bedroom house. And we were able to build this house working together. So the message is, you know, put the relationship first. I should have started out with that, but oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, can you show us the little view? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I would the, love the water to. And... Absolutely. So this is where our hot tub is for the safe space. And we have a lagoon here. So, That's pretty nice. you know, yes. our mornings are started by sitting out and having coffee. And then we also have a, a wonderful pool space out here. Nice. But we sit out here in the lagoon and we relax with our dog and kind of regroup um, because we know 
you know, we want to have a productive day and we know that it could actually be quite stressful. So we do that time for ourselves. We don't talk much too, I notice when we're sort of doing this sacred bonding time, but we are bonding. Maybe we're sharing a funny video or my husband's giving me the dog and I'm cuddling him. <laughs> so it's sort of like creating a safe space for each other. Cause I think what can happen when you work together with your spouse is a lot of judgment from what happens in the personal relationship can kind of bleed into the company stuff and you can start pointing fingers and you don't want to get to that place. So, yeah. Yeah. I relate. I don't talk in the hot tub to it's silence <laughs> time uh, as a three and 10 day silent meditator, you know, like uh, I value silence quite a lot. Um, thank you for showing up today, Jen, and sharing all these insights. Can you tell us uh, where can people find out a bit more about you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I think my my TikTok is where you can find all the great recipes and things we talked about. And that's Body Soul Alchemy. My website also Body and Soul Alchemy. And where you can reach me if you're, you know, a practitioner, or you're in the health space and you're looking for coaching. Uh, Big Boost Marketing is is our joint company and uh, on Instagram, Body Soul Alchemy as well.